is ABT time in California, where it is three o'clock in the afternoon, and in Melbourne, Australia, where it is what time, Jen? Uh, eight o'clock Thursday morning. Good morning from a quite really cold Melbourne morning, I have to say. I'm freezing. I'm holding my cup of tea just to cope. <laughs> um, and we've got a sneak preview there of one of our, our, our secondary <laughs> guests, but she's not invited yet. So don't be jumping in yet. Uh, this is going to be the three on one show, three Australians versus one sad little American trying to defend Well, himself. it's about bloody time because Randy, <laughs> seriously, you, you put me in the thick of it last week with your Eurocentric stupid quiz. I mean, come on, who cares about all of those former US presidents and other no-hopers? So it's well, about the, time you let me bring in some quality Aussie friends. The three of you can gang up on me with your own quiz, make up your own questions as we go along. Um, we have got two awesome guests with us and then probably a few other people will join us later, but two Australians. And this is going to be a little bit make it up as we go along. We got so many different things we can talk about. The primary guest is Dr. Rod Lamberts from the Australian National University, their Center for Science Communication. He can fill in the details on his credentials. I'm the worst credentializer ever for guests. <laughs> I, I just, you know, I've, some of these episodes, I've just told, <laughs> told people, tell us your own credentials. Do it yourself. This, this is a DIY credential show. Well, Rod, um, Rod and I are both at the Australian University that that um, tells the world that it's the best Australian university. So if you like, Rod and I could just slag off at each other about that. It'd get pretty boring, but, you know, we both claim to be the best. So <laughs> one up each other on your credentials. For your <laughs> be university. fun, wouldn't it, Rod? Not. <laughs> Definitely not. Uh, I'm, I'm no good at fighting. I'm, I'm a lover, not a fighter. And I've got to say, <laughs> I, I love the, the uh, intro music is very corporate, Randy. I'm disappointed. Next thing you'll be cutting your hair and removing your piercings what's going <laughs> that's, on that's uh, an upcoming episode as a matter of fact and uh he's trying to organize the laser work for his tats first rod that's the first step rod is our primary guest and i've got lots of great questions but we might as well bring on our secondary guest sorry to um put you in the secondary slot Gee, it's Jay, hierarchical but... this week so <laughs> hierarchical <Exactly. laughs> primary and secondary um, and Jay, that's because Jade is part of our team overall and a member of the narrative blitz and all kinds of other things. And seven, does that mean from, Rod's not part of the team? Um, oh, no. uh, he is now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I bring no pressure, in unbiased Randy. perspective. I bring in completely outsider. I don't like any of you and everything you do is dumb perspective. Cause that's helpful. A bit of tension. <laughs> creative, um, which, which actually sets the stage for the first little anecdote I have to offer up for introducing our two guests, which takes place about four or five years ago at South by Southwest, where we did a panel, Jade, Rod, and I, and each of them were my separate Australian friends. They'd never met each other. And we went to dinner the first night and I introduced the two of them. And I thought they'd get to know each other. And after about two or three or four, I don't know how many beers, suddenly, instead of the two of them being my separate friends, they two, <laughs> two of them realized they had more in common with each other than with me. And sat across the table from me. And it was like with each beer, they morphed more and more into looking like a couple of lizards, <laughs> <laughs> lashing their tongues out at me as they began ridiculing and making fun of the American uh, with all their awesome. What would you yanks know about anything? Yeah, yeah bloody That's separos. exactly what it was. Ah, you think I, you're better us. Ah, wow, wow, wow. Nah, I don't remember that at all. I, I think yeah. you're making it up. Um, I'm telling you, it was the craziest evening watching these two people morph before me from my friends into <laughs> each other's friends teamed up against me, uh, which is probably what's going to happen now. The good thing we're not having any alcohol here as far as I know, but maybe we will before we're done. Uh, you don't know what's Jen in this coffee, mate. <laughs> Jen will join in as well. And let's see. You know, yeah, I'm we've feeling together. sad. I haven't been part of a dinner. You know, let's. The main reason now for for COVID ending is purely so I can get together with you guys for dinner and gang up on Randy even more. Bring it on. All of that will happen in the near future, um, coming soon. To or, or, or not so near future. <laughs> <laughs> And let's see, we got a million things to talk about here, and we'll get into more background details. But I just want to start the ball rolling here with a simple question. Uh, about, oh, maybe a month or so ago, I was a guest on Rod's podcast called The Wholesome Show. Um, and here's the simple question. I've done about 25 podcast interviews or so, at least. I don't know how many. And of course, my favorite one is Park Howell's podcast, The Business of Story, where I've been a guest about five times. And in fact, next week, 
Uh, I'll be a guest again as we announce the release of our new book. That we're doing the business version of the Narrative Gym book, which I'm, I'm very excited about. Um, but here's the question. Given that I've done 25 or so interviews and in other podcasts, why is it that I found Rod's episode a month ago to be the very best ever? Rod, give me an answer to that. What was it that was so good about your podcast that, that made me say that? Look, I think you have good taste, obviously. I think we have to, we have to acknowledge that where it's, uh, where it's due. I, I, look, it's because we, talking to you because your story guy meant that I had to think very hard about what approach we'd take having a yak with you. And I didn't want to go, this is Randy. He went to Harvard. He has books. Oh, my God. He's like three <laughs> years older than me. It's amazing. I didn't want to do that. So we wanted to get a story rolling that wove you in that didn't make you, um, I don't know, didn't make you a product. So that's why I chose to start talking about your movie reviews and stuff from, uh, what was it? Sizzle. Sizzle, Hello, which, which was tremendous. Yeah. Um, Jay yeah, or Jen, did either that, of you get the, the chance to listen to that episode with Rod? I so I've, to I've just listened to it. Sorry, Jade. I've, I've been out running this morning and that was my, my running playlist was listening to you guys. So it's just happened in my world. It wasn't a month ago. Um, and I have to say, I think, Randy, you and I'll have to take some notes from this. I just thought Rod was impeccably, impeccably prepared, probably the opposite of what we've done today. <laughs> um, and, Rod, I just thought you got the balance perfectly right between um, pushing a whole lot of tricky questions while also just having a really friendly, supportive conversation. As a, and as a listener, it was obvious that you were all on the same team and you were all angry and frustrated and irritated and overwhelmed by some crap stuff that just keeps happening. But you also pushed a whole lot of really, uh, really interesting questions. And, yeah, it was just clear to me how much thought you'd put into it. So hats off to you, mate. It was really, it was it, very it really good accompaniment. It really, really was. And, you know, I think you hit on the key thing there, which is um, I love doing Parks podcasts, but he and I don't have the depth of background and common territory in terms of those frustrations, which is exactly what what Rod brought out. And I, I've told him about 20 times I had all this fear and trepidation. I think I even sent an email to Jade about it saying, you know, I bet these two guys, Rod and Will, all they're going to do is just ridicule me, the American. So I got to be ready for the blah, blah, blah. And I got on there. It was the, the exact opposite. They brought out those three reviews he found of sizzle which just opened the door to all of the psychological bruises that i have from dealing with this goddamn science community and what i've done for 30 years and there's a lot of good people that have really appreciated the work and helped out a lot but nobody ever warned me 30 years ago that if you try and innovate in the world of science communication you're just going to get crapped on by a certain solid part of the crowd that feels it's their professional obligation to demonstrate how critical they are as thinkers and to just negate what you're trying to do. And, you know, it was a little bit in the beginning, but sizzle was the, that was the be all and end all that brought out all the very worst in that in particular, that Tuesday morning where we had 65 science bloggers, we sent advanced uh, DVDs of the movie with the arrangement with them that they would all write their own little independent reviews. They would all go live on science blogs, uh, whatever it was, Seed Magazine had it. This was in 2008. And that Tuesday morning at 6 a.m., they would all appear at once. And we sat in my office at Raleigh Studios with the six or seven people who worked with me as they read these things aloud. And a bunch of them had conspired together. They'd gotten together and matched notes about what a horrible movie it was. And it was, it was just unbelievable. And you picked, you know, three, of, not even the worst, but you picked three really bad ones. And and then the movie got out there. You know, we had to You're overcome welcome. that hurdle once we got it out there to more normal, broader audiences and large screenings of hundreds of undergraduates howling with laughter and thoroughly enjoying it. You know, we overcame that whack in the kneecaps that we got at the beginning with all those science bloggers. So it's it's been that dynamic all along. And, and this is part of the joy next week of releasing this book with Park into the world of business where they don't do this stuff the way that the, the science community does when it comes to communication at times. So Anyhow, that's how deep that that discussion was with you, Rod. And I, I can't thank you enough for it. You know, it was a cathartic thing for me. Jade, were you able to hear, listen to any of it? Are you there, Jade? Yes, yes. I actually chose to listen to it with a civilian. So we were in the car with someone I was driving with and I thought, I'll, I'll roll the dice and hopefully this will be a good episode. I know you and I know Rod and I know Will, so it'll be pretty entertaining. And she's someone in the in the science and media world and she also said it was fantastic. So you have an unbiased outsider's opinion. And I think it was because you were dealing with some of those genuine frustrations that you talk about, Randy, that everyone in the science communication space has come up against at some point is 
we want to be able to get our message across, but we're frustrated why the lack of um, a willingness to listen in the yeah. science community. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. And at this point, um, I've written five coming up on six with this next book. Um, and, and you think it's it's no longer me. I'm not this disgruntled guy. I mean, that's a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge. And I'm telling you, after all those books, th this is it, it's really, really bad. And it's it's what Michael Crichton, I think, went through that that I think it was part of what drove him into becoming a climate skeptic was it just eventually developing this attitude of F you people. And it's what I talked about at the end of the first book um, about what they did to Carl Sagan with the National Academy of Sciences. That guy had a distinguished career, did all this incredible media work, and the whole national, two thirds of the National Academy of Science voted against letting him into the academy, even though I think about a quarter of the members there, his, his credentials were far above at least a quarter of the, the existing members there. It, it is the bane of the science world. And it's not just a little trivial party conversation topic there's a price to it. Half a million people died in this country in the past year from the pandemic. And I think not, not the majority of the blame, but a solid chunk of that goes to the science biomedical community for their failure to communicate effectively. And by the way, I say this because right this minute, um, we'll see what he does. But this morning, my good buddy, Michael Osterholm, who you guys know I worked with for about four months at the beginning of this year, and Mike Osterholm was one of the 16 people on Biden's um, pandemic advisory uh, uh, board er earlier in the year. And I worked with him on his podcast for about four months. He last October was on Meet the Press and was the only major epidemiologist who talked about communication. All the rest of them said, oh, we got to get to work and get this vaccine. Yes, you do. That's a good idea. But once it's done, you also need to understand this communication stuff so you can get everybody to take it. And guess what? That's where we are now. We can't get the stubborn the third of the population to do the vaccine. And Mike was the one guy who ended up on this national show, meet the press and said, here's, here's a big problem. We're not speaking with a singular voice here and we're not taking advantage of storytelling and we need to do a better job of the communication. Based on that, I track down. Don't, don't feel bad. That also happens in the civilized world. Like in Australia, we have the same problem. Yeah. So it's not just you backward. <laughs> yeah, we sure do. I, I know, but you know, this is a big, powerful, I mean, the U.S. has led the world on developing the vaccine and they're, they've patted themselves on the back for doing a great job there, but they have, there's no discussion of the communication stuff other than to just blame everything on the right. You know, the right ruins everything. It's all their fault. So anyhow, yeah, it goes, goes on and on. But I, I mentioned Osterholm because he got in touch a couple of days ago and we are working on an editorial. We'll see if we manage to get it out there. But he called me this morning and he asked, he said, is it OK if I do my whole episode today about you, Randy Olson, and your voice? And why isn't that a part right now of what's going on with the discussion on COVID? And that's great. And I just said, you know, do what you want to do. We'll, we'll hear what he does for the episode. But that's what he's going to talk about. I, I We've written this draft editorial. We'll see if he gets any traction with it. But um uh, in the editorial, what it's about is I coined this term corrected science. And I said, this is a term that's needed. Uh, um, you've what's going on right now is that last week Biden or you know, Biden said his wacky thing about uh, Facebook is killing people with their misinformation. And what I've said in this thing is enough with the misinformation. We're not getting anywhere with that battle. It's, you know, it's your information versus mine. That's not a viable direction. And this is now leading to a topic you and I talked about a week ago, Rod, which is this, um, risk aversion stuff and that they're they keep going with the the misinformation thing what's missing right now is innovation and experimentation and broadening out the boundaries of taking chances on things they did it that's how they got the vaccine so quickly was all these labs went to work and experiment with different directions and rapid innovation but the communication world continues to communicate no different than 30 to 40 to 50 years ago. It's the same old stuff, the National Academy of Science, AAAS, and Science in Nature. And that's kind of this one block voice for the whole science world. I mean, is there anything really innovative wanna, that I've missed? I want to add, like, I've, I went to the AAAS the day after the Trump election, and DC was in shock. Everyone, like, hardly anyone went to work that day. The people that I was meeting with came in, like, sweatpants and a hoodie. Wait, wait, wait like, we, we, were, we were with you we're that day. Yeah, we oh, yeah. That yeah, in DC, yeah that's right. right that's right yeah yeah, yeah. so we were Clearly all there, hey, the three of us. If we were all hung over <laughs> that's what memory right you guys are obviously <laughs> highly memorable <laughs> <laughs> thanks jade 
<laughs> but remember what it was like it was horrible but i remember talking to you about this and we were all saying well now that trump's been elected maybe the groups like the triple as will actually do something about this communication stuff they'll realize if they if they haven't been active and now they're paying the price and all that i really saw come out of it was the march for science which fizzled away and nothing lasting no innovation no new programs to improve just now and- he's out they'll forget about it and furthermore, you know, unfortunately, this point wasn't made nationally, but the March for Science did not come from the leadership of the science community, it came from three mid-level scientists who said, why isn't anybody doing anything? They sowed the seeds for the March for Science. And then after the fact, as you remember, um, half of the science organizations said, oh, yeah, of course, we'll do that. And half of them just said, no, we're not going to be a part of that. And they did the thing. And then because it had got some people there and they saw the public turning out for it. And then some of the organizations after the fact. So, yeah, we're, we're with them. Uh, there's just no leadership in all that sort of stuff. And that's exactly what you're talking about. It goes on and on and on. But, but um, Rod, I think, you know, you I wanna... think exactly what you're talking about is just played out in a little microcosm in my state in Australia this week. So we've had ongoing absolute lamenting calls for why on earth can't we have a decent vaccination um, advertisement? So what the, what the government's come up with has been appalling. Like there's just been nothing, this absolute dearth of anything that might convince someone to get vaccinated and then this week the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra and a whole lot of other artists produce this beautiful vaccination ad that's being spread everywhere everyone's watching it everyone who shares it on Twitter is like you know I challenge you not to shed a tear when you watch this wait 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 tell, 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 hang, hang on slow down, slow down. Tell, tell us more about that ad in detail what, so what? so the ad is a whole lot of well-known performers here in Victoria musicians opera singers um, everyone you can think of talk Talking about wanting to be able to give their performance of a lifetime and they can't because they can't get on stage until people get vaccinated and so everyone needs to to give COVID you know needs to show their own performance of a lifetime by going and getting vaccinated so we can reinvigorate the arts because Melbourne is a very arts proud and, and arts um, centered city and it's just this you know it speaks to the heart it gives people a reason to understand why they need to get vaccinated and it came from the arts community it didn't come from any of the scientists oh god is john farnham or jimmy barnes in it no Ah. (laughs) no it was mainly done by the the orchestra (laughs) can i start a fight over this yeah i want to start a fight fight. for you randy um i saw that ad too and i understand the emotion behind it i understand the intent no i understand what people think the intent is but hang on we got an abt in progress here I, i sense a butt coming Keep yeah, going. awesome. I got a great big butt on this. Um, and it's no different to me to the March of March for Science. It it only speaks to the the crowd who are already motivated in that direction. I don't see any right wing anti-vaxxer um in a city accusing you latte sipping wankers kind of people going, Oh, well, if the artists want us to do it, then I've changed my mind. And that's what concerns me. I think um if we're talking, if we're talking from the point of view of genuine comms, it's going to reach people beyond our own church. Um, that ad won't do it. That's my feeling very strongly. And similarly, like the March for Science made my eyes roll so hard, I got a migraine because there were people literally at a Parliament <laughs> House in Australia singing, all we are saying is please give science a chance, sincerely. <laughs> and I wanted to run up there and tell them to shut up now and run away and hide because the media will see this and you look like fuckwits because it made them look really irrelevant, made them look really more distant from people than they ever could have before. Um, when we did, a, we did a wholesome show live talking about the March for Science, we had a Nobel Prize winner, the CEO of the Australian Academy of Science, a professor of psychom, and a fourth guest who I'm sure was completely memorable, but they were fourth and I'd been drinking. But with all the <laughs> talking, we said to them, so what do you think of the March for Science? And everyone started like this. Well, and then they gave their opinion for this the same reason so i've got no beef with that arts victoria ad it's very beautifully done it's a bunch of performers being very sincere but i i can test that that will not move anyone who most of the people who watch that and love it probably already vaccinate i will will wager very strongly um so i don't think it has persuasive power beyond their own group so it's great for getting the people together who care 
but I don't think it's great. Yeah, look, I, I, I don't disagree with you at all, Rod, and I'm not suggesting at all that it's the perfect advertisement, far from it, but it's the only one I've seen that might actually um, be remembered by some people. So whether it's, sure. it's simply an echo chamber, whether it's going to go beyond the echo chamber, I think that's hard to say. But my, I guess my two responses to that is, can you think of any single ad that will reach all audiences? I challenge you to do that. And if you can, bloody make it now so that we've got it. Um, and secondly... Yeah. Is it, um, you know, the fact that there are a whole lot of people in the arts community, I would think there's plenty of people in the arts community that haven't been vaccinated yet. So this is one type mm. of ad that is very carefully and beautifully made for a particular audience. And I was um, excited about the fact that there is an ad that I think is doing a good job. Will okay. it convince let, a whole lot me, of anti-vaxxers? No, of course it won't. Yeah. Let me jump in on that. First off, to disagree with everything all of you say, whatever you're saying, I don't even know what it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You just but, disagree with the world, Randy. That's Go right. Having it. established that. Um, the, the thing that you're alluding to there, Jen, it, maybe you're not saying this directly, but it comes up a lot when people are attacking me was, all right, so then what would you make as the one ad that would miraculously convert everybody? And that's such a stupid sort of straw man argument. Well, you don't have any good ideas. That's not what it's about. Here's what it's about. This is what, what Rod and I were talking about last week, which is I don't know what the solution is, but I know what the process that's needed is to get there, which is yeah. it, it's it's selection. It's natural selection. It's artificial selection. It's what Darwin described, this simple mechanism of a two step mechanism that we had drilled into our head and, heads in graduate school of first step is variation. Second step is selection. And the variation has got to be really broad. And if you're not having broad variation, then the selection can't do anything. And this is what. Yeah goes on when you get these communities where they're doing the same damn thing over and over again. That's what I'm saying. For 50 years, science has been communicated the exact same way. When I try and step outside the box and make a movie like Sizzle, what happens? A reviewer for Nature in Nature magazine publishes a review shitting on my movie, causing at least five universities to cancel their plans that they were trying to pull together to screen my movie because they said you got a rotten review in Nature. At the same time, I got great reviews in Hollywood Reporter and Variety and all the film magazines that said there's a really creative, different way to look at this. Uh, climate is issue. And that's my objection is I don't know what the answer is, but I know you're never going to get there if you're not encouraging variation and taking some chances. And on that note, Rod, pick up on what we were talking about with, with risk aversion. Well, risk aversion, I'll, I'll say two things there. I agree. You've got to, you've got to try shit out. You've got to um, relax a little and, and be prepared for things not to work. But also I'm sort of coming back, and this does relate to risk, coming back to what you were saying earlier about, you know, it's more complex, et cetera. I'd argue actually it's not. And I, it, look, we, we talked about this many a time over beers and not um, the advertising community, the PR community, um, idiotic politicians like your former leader and our current leader, they know, say the same thing, whatever the hell it is, 9 million times every day on every possible channel. That's all you have to do. Uh, it won't work for everyone, but it'll work for a shitload more people than most of these other tailored, crafted, special, clever, dumb, whatever ads. I, I want to see, and I'd like to see it for climate too. Climate's changing. We fucked it up. We have to fix it. I'd like to see that three versions of that three slogan repeated everywhere, all the time, anywhere you can. No other detail. People and going, what about you? Like we yeah. know that that works because yeah. that's why we see Coca-Cola ads all the time. If you Just want, repeat it. Ha, yeah, yeah. How do, if you want to know what's going to work, look at the biggest, most successful brands yeah. and just do that. Yeah, like for sure. Well, but and then that's, that's and the trust starting. it and trust it. Yeah. And then, but then that's run. the starting point is look at the proportionality spent by Coca-Cola on communication versus the product. I mean, sadly, that's the American way. You know, that's the classic comparisons between the Japanese and the U.S. where Japanese spend everything on developing a product and a little bit on advertising. U.S. makes a piece of junk and then <laughs> advertises the hell out of it, convinces everybody you got to have this. Um, somewhere in the middle is the happy medium. But then you look at this. This is the point I made all the way back. And don't be such a scientist. But budgets of Hollywood movies, what they spend on marketing there. I mean, that's the epicenter for that of let's make a crap. But you're still back to one voice. You're back to one voice still. So it doesn't have to cost a fortune. Scientists get interviewed all the time on yeah. bigger and larger venues, um, <clears throat> write pieces more and less popular all the time. Uh, it happens a lot. Asked to advise on movies or fiction, whatever it is. If, if you talk about speaking with one voice and sticking together, and I don't know if you know someone who trains a lot of science people, maybe you do, Randy, I don't know. Um, <laughs> getting them to, to do that. When someone says, tell us about climate or tell us about vaccines, you say, vaccination is going to make it better, full stop. And when everyone says, well, what about, what about? You go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. vaccination is going to make it better. 
don't don't like training people not to engage any further do the legal argument don't ask the next question yeah just say the first yeah. thing and shut up i'd love to see that tested more broadly well and so then and what, what what with that comment what you're tracking right back to is what i was saying that was what osterholm had said on national tv here and meet the press which is we're not speaking with a single voice we've got yep. all these different people yep. yeah it's we've got this whole cacophony and what you get is a lot of people say well that's the beauty of it you know we've got a diversity of voices out there that's but that's not strategic communication you know it's getting those voices to come together into that as you say, the single yeah. Can I throw, voices. Yeah, because otherwise mission. people otherwise people don't know who to trust and they end up feeling confused and they feel hamstrung to make any good any decision. Let, let's hear that's, what that's Estonia feels about this. What, I was what gonna do say, Estonia have to say I just want to throw in something really controversial that both Rod and Jen are gonna hate, but one of the best communicators for keeping a consistent voice and leading the narrative in Australian politics was John Howard, who for our American audience was the yep. prime minister and the conservative prime minister at the time when George Bush was president. Um, so they were, you know, they did a lot of projects together. You might've heard of them like the war. Um, but John Howard, would, <laughs> you would, you'd be like, g'day, John, how are you today? And he's like, I'm well, because I'm here to talk about X message. And they yeah. would try and distract him with all different things. And he would never deviate from his message. So whenever he was on on television or being interviewed, you knew that he would stick to the script and his party kind of was, was pretty good at it. And that's why he was elected four times. Well, but I'll I you forever want to oh, yes, know, Andrew. how did he go from the laughing stock in the 1980s when I lived there? He was a cartoon character ridiculed by the entire country. And then one day I pick up the newspaper in the 90s and he's he's the big boss. <laughs> You're forgetting we had Tony Abbott. I, I'm going to take what you said, yeah. Jade, agree with it and run even harder. Tony Abbott, the the a living brain in a jar, barely connected to humanity <laughs> or any of his senses, he became prime minister. Don't because, be so generous to him, Rod. Don't be so well, generous. Well, he was very fit. I'll give him that. And the reason I hate our current prime minister even more is because he's actually made me say the sentence, even Tony Abbott, insert sentence here, and that I'm not happy about. But yeah, Tony yeah. Abbott was a genius at having, he had, no matter what he was asked, he said, oh, I'm going to stop the boats, ax the tax, and there was a third one I forgot. And I remember when he was asked, he made himself the minister for women, which is beyond ironic. And the classic line there was, of course, he's minister for women. He owns three himself because he has two daughters <laughs> and a wife. That's That was a comment. So he made himself minister for women, which was beyond ironic. And when he was asked when he got in, what have you done for women? He said his election slogan, I stopped the boats, refugees. I axed the tax, carbon tax. And the third one, if you want on message and getting an idiot, barely sentient lump of meat in a speedo to get become prime minister, that's what you get from that three-word slogan. It really works. Like it really let, works. Let's, let's take a one-second diversion to uh, juice media and shit fuckery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Except they're not running for office yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yet. Hopefully it's yet. They should run the National Communications Office for your whole government. But we have all that evidence. I mean, for my money, yeah, the John Howards, the Donald Trumps, et cetera, and we've talked about this in different combinations many a time. These people win because they just do that. They don't make it complicated. They make it damn simple and relentless. Oh, okay, all right. Here's the perfect segue into this, um, which eventually, Marlis, you can join us for this discussion. So this this will add a little bit of life and fun. I came across this yesterday. I don't know if you've seen this. Um, There's a research article that just came out titled Science, Policy, and the Public Discourse of Shark, Quote, Attack, a Proposal for Reclassifying Human Shark Interactions. Let me read you the abstract for this research proposal. Or no, research oh, man. paper. This, um, this title is making me, making have, have me you, twitch. Have you, have you seen this already? I, I don't know how <laughs> no, I no, but, it. But, it's but, from one of these PLOS type things. Um, so here's tell us the, the worst. Uh, here we go. Um, there are few phrases in the Western world that evoke as much emotion or as powerful an image as the words shark and attack. However, not all, at least they're ABT form there. Um, however, not all quote shark attacks are created equal. Under current labels, listing of shark attack may even include instances where there is no physical contact between shark and human. The dominant perception of intent laden shark quote attacks with fatal outcomes is outdated as a generic term and misleading to the public. We propose new descriptive labels based on the different outcomes associated with humans, with human shark interactions, including sightings, encounters, bites, and the rare cases of fatal bites. We argue two central points. First, that a review of the scientific literature shows that humans are, quote, not on the menu as typical shark prey. Second, we argue that the adoption of a more prescriptive code of reporting by scientists, the media, and policymakers will serve the public interest by clarifying the true proposed, uh, the true pose risk posed by sharks and informing 
better policy making. Finally, we applied these new categories to the 2009 New South Wales shark meshing report in Australia and the history of shark incidents in Florida to illustrate how these changes in terminology can alter the narratives of human shark interactions. Basically, they're wanting to be splitters instead of lumpers. And so they want to talk about fatal bites versus non-fatal bites versus bumps and whatever. Talk amongst yourselves about that. <laughs> who, who do they want to talk to like this? Or do they just say- They want to ch change the, the, everybody. Yeah, this is how from here forward, we should talk. We should never use the term shark attack. We should talk shark fatal bite, shark mini bite, shark <laughs> lunch nibble. Shark, no, shark, shark, shark had a little nibble on your baby, on your pinky toe. Don't worry about it. <laughs> shark shark ate, ate your baby. <laughs> yeah, shark ate your dingo. <laughs> oh, no. It only took how many minutes? <laughs> God. Um, so, I mean, that's, it's just, it all boils down to splitters versus lumpers. And you get these people who want to be accurate on everything by being splitters. And they just aren't understanding that there's a trade-off that by splitting everything down and making the language as complicated as possible. Yeah. You might be always right, but everybody falls no asleep. One cares. Yeah. No one cares. But also, no, no one's going to remember. I would challenge, I reckon you could do a really interesting experiment there and report a whole lot of different shark bites and then test people on what they remembered, you know, an hour later, a week later, a month later, and all people would remember. Shark, human, human got hurt. They're not going to remember the finer wording anyway. Yeah, exactly. Mini bites and megabytes and who knows what. You've got, um, you got to step back. In every situation, I only hear stories like this uh, infinity times a working day. And my bottom line is, what's it for? Yep. You know, all this this yeah. pronouncement into the ether, what we need to make comms better, dot, 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 is X. And you're like, comms better for what? Among whom? Blah, blah, blah. It makes yeah. consulting in Psycom one of the most taking candy from a baby jobs I've ever had when I've done it, because all you got to say is, what's your actual goal? And they go, oh, we haven't yeah. thought of that. So I didn't think so. <laughs> well, well first you ask them common. what's their goal. First you ask them what's their goal. And then you ask them who's their audience. And then you, you know, you sort it out from there. Sit well, and all of which boils down at the simplest level of the basic, what's your problem? You know, at the yeah. core of yeah. the whole ABT dynamic. And, and, and then you find out as we do with the course. Yeah. The vast majority of people, when you ask them what's their problem, they've got this giant grant and everything else. And then their eyes roll back in their head like, well, it might be this. And how can you be running this huge thing and not even be able to say what your problem is? Um, yeah, this is no different. The, the, uh, it first struck me, I used to talk with climate scientists, I don't know, 20 years ago, and I'd have them crying. I'd go and have a coffee with them because there are a lot, there's a big climate mob in our university. And they'd start crying. They were so upset about it. no one would listen to them. And they'd keep saying to me, what we need is to get the science out there. And I'd nod politely and say, let me get you another coffee and go, cool. Why? They go, oh, well, so that I'll recycle, uh, not drive cars. I said, cool. So you, you want to get climate science out there or you want people to do this behavior? And they looked at yeah. me like, what's the difference? But then you could see eyes light up. And well, I feel it, bizarre that that's still the same question I'm asking 20 years later. Not and, because and at the, or stupid people. the biggest and broadest of scales, which is exactly the strategy that I set in on 20 years ago with our Shifting Base Science campaign, it all begins by creating a likable voice, a voice that people want to listen to. That's where it all starts. You, you really have to have a voice that people want to listen to. And so often the science world has picked these spokespeople that are just like everybody disconnects, starting with Al Gore. That's exactly what happened with Al Gore. I'm from Kansas. All my friends in Kansas back in 2005 and six, when that started to come together, they all just said, we're not going to listen to a word that guy says. So, you know, that's a, an instant direct uh, choice. And the better quote on that was my mother who um, told me that she was listening to something on NPR. And this guy said, oh, Al Gore is so great. His voice is like a fine Merlot. And my mother would always say, that's the wine that puts me to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. uh, the best way to do this when you're talking about getting using a voice that will people, people will listen to, have you seen that movie, The Big Short? Yo, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. You're right. And yes, when they're trying perfect. to explain a complicated yes. thing, they yeah, just yeah. put Margot yeah. Robbie in a bathtub drinking champagne. And she's like, let me tell you. Yeah, yeah, I just started listening. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> They're like, we know it's boring. So here's Margot Robbie in a bathtub to explain it to you. And That's like, right. Yeah, just do that. Yeah. yeah. What do you take away from that message? Uh, my uh, bathtub. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, unfortunately, they had her explaining derivatives, which nobody, no matter how good a job she did, no one would really. I'm okay. I accept that, that but, message. I accept. But that said, you know, smaller, <laughs> less ambitious piece of information. You're absolutely right. I mean, it starts with the messenger. And speaking of great messengers, one of them has just joined us. Hopefully, the other one, Mike Strauss, will as well. 
Uh, Marlis, bring us some great message from the great wild where you appear to be at the moment. That's the Himalayas uh, in Bhutan. And I just think you probably should put the shark in that bathtub. That would get people's attention. So, <laughs> With Margot <and> Robbie. I, <laughs> so it might be a little baby shark, but still, or a big bathtub. But I think <laughs> the bottom line is, you know, what makes sharks so interesting to people is that they're, they're dangerous. You know, it's kind of this car wreck thing. People can't look away. It's awful. It's, it's, it's you know, anxiety inducing, but they can't look away. So this is why sharks are so popular. And this article you just said, it goes, it's well intended, but it goes in the wrong direction. And I bet all the, the attention sharks get because they're such marvelous predators has also provided a lot of funding for research, uh, like great whites and so on. So um, I agree with everybody that uh, that would be probably the wrong way to go. Uh, and Mike Strauss, do you have an opinion on whatever in the world it is we're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> or are you just gearing up to go surfing with me on Monday? Um, yikes. Um, Mike, are, are you there? there? You're muted, yeah. Mike. There you go. I'm trying to get this to turn on. But um, yeah, I, I, I was. I, you're talking about this, and I'm tinkering with my other uh, pet peeve, which I know it's a term Randy loves, and that's how to get uh -oh. how to get public engagement with science. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's the, the SciComm community has turned to sort of making it the public's responsibility to engage. How do we, how do we get the public to engage in the, in, with science? And there isn't so much talk in how do, you, how do you give the message? How do you as scientists explain what's important to the public? It's we're doing such wonderful things and the public has to learn to engage with us. And I think that that that's where, where I see the SciComm community going. And I think it's a dead end. Rod, you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, not not my SciComm community. Um, no, I, I understand why people would often see that. But no, that, that wouldn't be my um, attitude at all. For me, when I hear that, how do we get the public to engage? I think like with anything else, my favorite analogy down in Australia is we have a sport called Australian rules football. Go Pies. I do not care about it at all. There's nothing about it that I like other than it. In fact, no, there's nothing about it I like. It annoys me because it sucks all the good athletes away from rugby union, the real sport. And it means we can't beat New Zealand. Oh. And that really annoys me. We can't <laughs> beat New Zealand because they go and play AFL. And so I say, whenever I have people saying to me, as I'm sure Jen and Jade would like to know, what you've got to understand about AFL is it's really good for these reasons. I'm like, I'm not coming to your party. I'm not interested. I don't care. You haven't made it seductive to me. All I see is a thing that takes it away from something I actually like. Um, and the making people enjoy science or encouraging people to engage with science, I think is very similar. Um, why would they? Like my reason for engaging with AFL or not is because it just doesn't, it doesn't mean anything to me. It's kind of a bit annoying. Sorry, but it is for me. Um, and similarly, people might find that with science. I'm, I'm, my job as a psychom guy is not to make people or entice or finesse or seduce people to like science. It's to help more scientists say, well, if you think your shit's important and you want people to be into it, let's work with you and think about how and why they would be. And also yeah, be prepared to accept that maybe they won't be and that's fine too. I mean, a lot of people do things that other people don't like and that's fine. There's, there's like no turning point. it around. That's the point is, is you've got you've to find a way, instead of find a way to make people like what you like, you've you tell them why it's important to them and you don't worry about whether they know all the details of it. And I okay, but let's, let's talk specifics. If we're going to make some points here, let's talk about somebody's study on this, that, and the other thing. Um, Rod, you seen any things along these lines that people are doing some good work uh, getting back to that thing about broadening out the range of experimentation and trying to understand how communication works. Do you see anybody that have done some novel and interesting things to get a better and we know what the problems are we know we've got these blocked off demographics that aren't listening to the other side um any thoughts can, Rod? can i talk about the new zealand um the car yeah. app the, yeah, yeah. so there okay so there was a problem in new zealand that they identified that young men particularly uh native new zealanders maori men were known for drinking and driving so the how do you actually get through to that audience so it's about when we are scientists we'll have this problem like how do i get my information into someone else's head and how do i change their behavior and often we think it's about us but it's actually you need to get 
you need to adapt your message to the other person. Don't even worry about what you have to say. It's think, put yourself in the other person's shoes. So New Zealand Traffic Commission came up with the best, one of the best ads I've ever seen. It was hilarious. It it was um, by all, it was all acted out by young Maori men. And it's ran through the scenario that if this guy lets his friend drink and drive, what will happen when he dies? And it goes into like, he'll be a ghost and he's going to come and haunt my family. It was so hilarious. And then at the end, they offer a solution that's like, tell him to just crash here, mate. Yeah, just crash here. So by making it funny, by using actors that were actually from the community, it wasn't like an old white guy being like, don't drink a drive. It's very dangerous. They turned it around and made it accessible and humorous and moved the message down from the head down to the gut. Um, It was able to actually turn that statistic around and decrease um, drink driving accidents in New Zealand. Which matches in with Park's thing about the the customer is the hero. You're not the hero. Um, the, yeah, it's about listening to the customer, or the demographic, and making marketing them... has known this for decades. Like, exactly. why is this so hard? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, Randy, it, my it, best it, example is in in Australia. When I was a kid, we'll we'll say that was more than a couple of decades ago. Um, as you were driving down the road to go to your coastal retreat or whatever it may be, throwing your your rubbish, your garbage, your trash. Sorry. I'll, think about my audience you trash out the window was totally acceptable and normal um littering was normal and then they started with some ads that were all about you know australia is your home you shouldn't put rubbish around your home very sincere i didn't notice much but as i grew older i think i was about 20 25 Mm -hmm. i was standing around in sydney and they started pulling out these ads that said don't be a tosser and tosser for uh, non-english english English speakers it's a wanker it's a uh, (laughs) a a self manipulator gratuitous self manipulator the tosser also tossing garbage. And so these ads came out, don't be a tosser. Whenever there's groups of young people standing around, one of them would throw their drunken kebab on the ground afterwards and they'd look at them and say, basically, you've been a tosser, mate. That seemed to gain traction. Nowadays, um, you would just not see it. If anyone's throwing trash out the window, dropping on the ground, they would be shamed so quickly, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, and, and similarly, you start to see it with recycling behaviours and these sorts of things. So partially, it's making it really easy for people, but it's also... Yeah, humanize it. The speeding ads, Jade, I don't know if you're in Australia back when um, lots of young boys, as is, I think, endemic to most countries, young boys love to speed and show how tough they are by spinning their wheels and so forth. And there's all these ads, you know, it's very dangerous and here's the science. And then finally, there were some ads where there'd be young guys smoking up their cars. Yeah. And there'd be women on the side of the street going like this. (laughs) And for those of you listening, I'm waggling my little finger uh, derogatorily. Because you've got a little dick, not you. Bro. Got a little dick, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so you'd flash back to the guy in the car who's smoking up, smoking up the wheels, feeling like he's awesome. And then he looks over and he sees these two, like hot women, showing their little dick approach, and their faces change and they look humbled and ashamed and they kind of sneak away. And my understanding, yeah. I don't have the studies at hand because I'm a terrible academic, was that gained some traction among critical demographics again. Not okay, science, that that is that is excellent. But now it's my turn to tell. And these are great. This is what I wanted was these specific stories. So here's my specific story. A woman named Faye Crevache with Wild Coast in San Diego, um, Mexican American and works a lot in Mexico City on turtle conservation. And years ago, probably about 10, 12 years ago, she put together this wonderful campaign, very similar, which was all the Mexican males think eating turtle eggs makes them macho and virile and everything like that. And then she got this supermodel to pose for these ads naked with everything strategically covered, holding her arms in front of her and saying, my man doesn't have to eat turtle eggs to get aroused. Um, And the commercials were hit that demographic, you know, the, the working class guys could relate to that. And it had some impact, but no sooner to get out there. Then a bunch of feminist groups got angry about it, especially in in the U.S. The New York Times had a public article about this. And so then you end up battling with these two ends of the spectrum that are trying to squelch you just as you're trying to speak through the channels that really can connect with those people. Exactly the same thing as your ad there with the little finger. That's that's awesome. But then no sooner you get that. And that's I don't know. That's one of the handicaps of getting across the spectrum there of trying to communicate with all these do-gooders that think that their world ought to be the world that dominates their set of rules and not understanding the, the, you know, can I say that Randy, I I agree. That's a, that's a, um, a problem or a potential problem, but this is something I say to students as well as colleagues stop for a moment and see how much effect that that genuinely has. There's always going to be someone pissed off with your approach. No, no question. Well, and that gets back to this thing I'm saying more or less. 
that's the thing I'm saying about variation, you know, at least be mm -hmm. trying those experiments, even in a small scale, go to one little city and try sure. some crazy idea and let it blow up and then throw it to the wayside. But if you're not doing, you know, in the, in the design world, it's called rapid, rapid prototyping. You come up with an idea and you mm -hmm. quickly make all these prototypes, you try them and this is what's wrong. You throw it out, you move on to the next, 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 next. And the communication world again is, does not do that. Doesn't begin to understand it. They just, it's, it's such a conservative approach. And to get back to um, actually to circle back to what I said about Osterholm and him doing the podcast is that he got picked for that Biden crew of 16 scientists. And then I talked with him about that's great. Now, when are they going to have the 16 communication people for their communications advisory board that not only that never happened, but he told me that he was on these zoom sessions where the communications people were there from the government communicators and he said they never spoke up. And my first thought was that's because they're incompetent. But my second realization was, no, that's because it's what I've seen at CDC, which is scientists intimidate. They get in a room and they start one upping each other with knowledge and information and the communications people just go quiet. They can't stand up against that stuff. And the scientists haven't been programmed to understand that you're ruining everything here by flexing your informational muscles. And that's where communications, then that all drives the communications to the bare minimum, most conservative strategy so that's, any thoughts that's on that a, i agree and that, that's um my story of that years ago and i was just finishing my phd in science communication i was sitting in a room full of old stale you know what is it st pale stale male white professors of science <laughs> the marketing that's what, committee that's what i almost became keep going <laughs> yeah so i was sitting in the marketing committee so there was me freshly phd or maybe not fresh, cynically phd and these guys and they started talking about the marketing committees and saying they're doing a shit job. They're doing a shit, shit job. And I just sat there quietly and watched and they said, yeah, because, um, you know, uh, Julie Bishop at the time was the foreign minister for the country is coming to give a presentation at our university. And that's all we heard about. In my department, two people got papers in nature. Two people got papers in nature this week and we didn't hear a damn thing about it in the media releases. And I looked at them and I was waiting for the ironic chuckle and there was none. And I didn't say anything because there was no point they weren't going to listen to me. So I thought that was interesting. The fact that the, uh, one of the most senior ministers was coming to talk, they thought was irrelevant, but their paper was. And the other one was in there saying, we're not getting enough first year students. Here's a problem. We don't get enough first year students in science. What do we do? And they all harumphed, rubbed their beards and said, well, we need to talk more about our stellar research. And they all, they all agreed. <laughs> and, and, yeah, yeah. and I said, cool, cool, cool. Can I just ask, how do you know that? And they looked at me like a mouse had spoken, except I don't sound like one. And, and, they went, what? And I said, how, how do you know that? What do you know about these people you're trying to reach who are in high school right now? Are they, when they look for the university, wondering about your stellar research record? And they again looked stunned and kind of said, oh no, that'd be ridiculous. And I said, so you haven't gathered any evidence or data on this? And again, they looked <laughs> stunned and looked at each other. And then there was this pause and they kept talking among themselves. And I'm not shy. I'm large. I'm male. I'm middle-aged. I'm white. I'm all the things. And it took for me to even say that was a push and they couldn't handle it. So the idea your comms yeah. people sitting around a table gain no traction doesn't surprise me at all. But it also means to me that people like me and my similars should be a lot louder. On well, uh, you know, that that is a portrait that needs to be painted for the whole science community. And they they won't ever allow that. But that I think there's that's what happened to me when Don't Be Such Scientists came out. I got invited to CDC and especially to NASA. Those are the two big places where communicators reached out to me and said, won't you come please spend a day here? And at CDC, we had a conference call the week before and they said, we're going to put you in a room with a bunch of these scientists because you have a PhD and you got tenure and maybe they'll listen to you because they won't listen to anything we tell them. They constantly tell us, get out of our my lab you know you're a distraction yep. and then they had me do these sessions with them where i said your all your research is going to amount to nothing if you don't work with these communications people um they really are it's it's a mismatch when you try and and you see it on the college campuses in the u.s at least the where the sciences have trampled over the humanities i do all these visits to the university i go to lunch mm -hmm. with these people and they just say you know our humanities programs have just been trampled over by the sciences and then we end up with a pandemic where a half million people die because those scientists didn't know how to persuade anybody yada yada god it just goes on and well, it's also it's back to your point the, the scientists also i'm generalizing wildly but why not good generalization keeps, keeps the world turning scientists pouncing on each other so whenever i do government stuff like talking to government groups etc they ask me questions what do we do what do we do and i say look psychom talking in public it's not for everyone nor should it be i'm not trying to suggest you should all be able to do this you know horses for courses and all that but please support people who do and if they fuck it up give them a hug make them a cup of tea and say don't worry tiger get out there and try again let's try something new don't pounce on them and say i told you it wouldn't work ha ha 
Science <laughs> should be always sciencey. Like support the others, and you know it's that classic, you know, hashtag wave magic wand culture change. Yeah, culture yeah. change is slow; it's glacial. We know that, but it does have to start with things like that. So that's what. But, I'm but you're 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 hitting into the deeper core, which the interesting thing with our good buddy Brian Palermo um, has had now a 12 year journey that I've led him into this world of science, and he, he I'm gonna we got to do an episode with him with with this same crew. Let's have us and our incisive minds work on Brian Palermo and, and pull out of him what he's learned in this journey because I brought him in 11 years ago, actually, with a blank slate from the world of comedy and Hollywood, didn't know the first damn thing about science. Now in our course, I listen to him talking and he is so knowledgeable and he now says, you science people, this is one of the things you need to know. You know, this is what you do with it. He's really picked up 10 years of observations. And one of the things he's come to realize is what I talked about in the don't be such a scientist voice. This profession at its core has got the voice of negation. It has got the big loud no. And that's what you're talking about there is that all else equal, everybody's trained in the big no. And that is such a cultural divide with communication, which has to have affirmation as the starting point. It's got agreement, contradiction, and consequence. That's where the ABT is so powerful to just show you analytically. Look, it starts with the A. If you're not getting the agreement there, nobody's nothing's going to happen marlis do you have anything to say about agreement contradiction consequence or context <laughs> yeah actually i thought that uh, rob made a very important point that as scientists that we do not have to let, reach out at each other so in a way the science community has to develop a, a brotherhood slash sisterhood where we support each other and i think one problem we face and i'm an academic uh, and i'm a professor at the university um one thing we face is that, you know, there is a lot of political correctness and I wouldn't necessarily describe it as muzzle, but that we are very, very cautious how far out on a limb we actually go as stating certain things. And that's very hard then. So in a way you want to throw in the towel and say, well, you know, why should I stick my neck out if uh, it could hurt me, my, my academic career, my students, whatever. So I just go do my thing. And so that you, in a way, provided a way out um, that if we develop the sense of community, maybe we can have others speak for us, other scientists, other science communicators who are not right now uh, in academic jobs. Yeah, but I, I would say at the core of all that, I mean, I'll continue to make this point endlessly and they'll hate hearing it, but uh, narrative is leadership and there's just no leadership in the science community. And it was built on a model in the 1950s and 60s that didn't need that sort of aggressive leadership. It had people like John Kennedy out there as its partner and voice to articulate what science needed. And there wasn't this attack on science that exists today, but now there's this attack and it's a whole system and institution that doesn't believe in leadership, believes in committees. And these committees are utterly faceless and directionless and they're all just lemmings running back and forth. So uh, it's so hard to address a lot of these problems. It's like, if you come up with something good, who's up at the top there to recognize, okay, this is, this is what, again, what Oster and I are talking about, this term of corrected science and getting back to the thing, what Biden said last week was, um, it was an interesting moment. Last Friday, there was a press conference and he had said that Facebook is killing people by allowing all this misinformation. And then Facebook said, you know, but look at how much we've canceled all this misinformation we've taken down. And then this guy in the press conference last Friday to Jen Psaki, he said, that's all nice. But what about uh, Fauci um, a year and a half ago said masks don't work. There's no point in wearing masks. Um, and that's still on Facebook. Why aren't you forcing them to take that down? Isn't that now misinformation? And I offered up this idea of there needs to be a term corrected information. That's what that is. That's this is educating the public on how science works. It comes up with information and then it corrects it and it's self-correcting and moves along. And there needs to be a term like that corrected information. But there's no leadership. You can come up with that term. But who do you who do you pitch it to? You know, who who this is like the ABT? This is what happened with Shirley Malcolm 12 years or you know, eight years ago when we first came up with the ABT. I pitched it to her and she said, I'm going to get the people at science to write a whole article about this ABT thing. You know, it can help so much. We're 10 years later and they didn't even begin. There's no voice elite, nobody at the top that says that's a good idea. Let's go that direction. It just, you got to send it all out for peer review. And in five to 10 years from now, maybe the system comes or I don't know. It's, it's just. Randy, it's, there's, there is, yeah. there, are, there is groundswell. Like I understand the frustration, but, and, and I agree at times and I rant and rave against the faceless man of science, but I do also see groundswell. I see it in um, first year students. I see it in new PhDs. I see it in some committees, some deans of science in Australia, at least again, though, civilized countries. So we're probably ahead of you guys, but it's, um, 
It's you have five. You have five minutes to tell us about groundswell. Where this is the five minute okay. warning. <laughs> okay. So the, the the groundswell. I'm I'm seeing changes in attitudes. I'm seeing shifts in approaches to an acceptance of things being a bit more broadly socially constituted and so forth than you might think. And the only thing I want to add to that is you, you talk about corrected science, and we've had a chat about this. I agree with the idea. I don't know if I'd necessarily use the term because I think it implies science need, is broken and is constantly being fixed, which I think is the wrong implication. However. What I would say is it's more about, it's this phrase like that's how science works or that's just science. No detail, just repeat it. White Fauci said this before and now he says that. Yeah, yeah but now, now we disagree on that. It, it, it's not a phrase. There, there needs to be one term that, you know, oh, I'm not and, saying and that's it's got to be agreed that's upon. That's yeah. the sentiment. That's the you, sentiment. You, yeah, just, you've got to have that singular term. Yeah. Uh, it, they've got to be, this is the experimentation thing. They've got to be yep. trying out new terms and if they can get some traction with it, then add it to the lexicon or throw it out. But that's not happening. Um, I agree. But anyhow, and so yeah. we should try that out. My only concern with corrected science is it'll end up like defund the police. It means one thing, but it's taken to something else. And that's, that's you got well, to experiment, will... find out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think anything corrected, then automatically people want to talk about incorrect. What about what about um, updated science or I don't know, there's got to be a good term we can start using to something. To and I will argue about. with you that corrected science is as good a term as any. And it's just a matter of somebody having the leadership to get out there and get a term out there and start using it mm. because there's no term right now. And that's what's going on. They had no answer. Jen Psaki sat there in the press conference, this guy attacking her. And she said, oh, well, you know, we're, we're thinking about that. No, you need to have something authoritative you can say back. That is corrected science. We, we had it, you know, 10 or three years ago. We realized it's not right and we moved on. And that educates the people that this science thing is this mechanism of self correct. They're always saying that it's self correcting, but there's none of that yeah. language. There's just no innovation going on. None, 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 none. And what do you expect? A half a million people dead. They take the blame for that, at least, science world, but they won't. And yeah, it's just that's the way it goes. Um, oh, well, we've got three minutes remaining. Uh, Jade, <laughs> you want to give us your Has anyone written that editorial? Thought? Like the science communication community is responsible for half a million deaths? Because I want to see I that. I, I could try. I couldn't get it published anywhere. I mean, that becomes the problem with, with editorials is that the editor said, well, that's not. I mean, it's like I wrote one for the Chronicle of Higher Education about simplicity discrimination. And they just dismissed it out of hand. We're not going to publish this. You know, yeah, simplicity is for idiots. Um, you can't even get a Don't worry about for don't worry about it. Work, work where you can make a difference. Because again, I, I still think groundswell is slow. Well, and that's I, that's our strategy nowadays is simply building Mount ABT. And that is what I've come yeah. down to now is that enough with all these other efforts. All I'm going to do nowadays is build Mount ABT as big as we can make it. We've got a ton of groups now lined up for the fall. It's really working. And now Parks in this new book is going to take it in the business world. And that's all you can do because the, so many of these people aren't, aren't going to listen until you, until the mountain gets so big that they what's, can't. What's ignore. ABT? We didn't talk about that. I'm not familiar with it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a concept we're thinking about making a podcast about. Um, we'll, we'll bring you back, Rod. We'll teach you. We'll teach you all about it next time. Um, sure. And on that note, Jen, can you give Rod a final thought for today? This group ate up an hour all too quickly. We're we're going to reassemble in the not too distant future. And, and we haven't even hour. had any beers. I, I know exactly. Everybody's all wound up. Speak for yourself. Uh, Jen. I just want yeah, to look, say one thing. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay Marlis. Um, you know, I don't think that 600,000 deaths in the U.S. can be blamed on science. Yes, on science communication. But we disagree. Science... A, a significant portion of it can be, I believe. Sure. So keep going. Yes. But science has also provided us with the vaccines. We know that. We know that. And that's what I, I said earlier was that that's great. It's just, it's a two-part process. First, you give us the solution, then you figure out how to actually implement it. And science had no plan on how to implement this. And now we're stuck with a third of the population saying, we don't care about your vaccine. We're not going to do it. And now the scientists are saying, well, the whole system, the herd immunity is not going to work if we don't get this happening. They're just, there's no innovation this on that side. Why do you like politicians into office so they get the message out? One would hope so. What, what say that again? Isn't this why we get elect politicians into office so they yeah, can get the, the message out? Yes, but the question that needs to be asked right now is why did Biden create an advisory board on the science side of 16, the top epidemiologists that did nothing on communication? And a lot of people ask this question, okay, now when's the 16 communications people having? That never happened. Where's the discussion about that? None. And there you go. So that's, that's what I think is missing on that front. Um, Jen, final comment to Rod? Um, well, I'm just super proud of my Aussie count, you know, my Aussie friends here, because I think that was a 
quite an impressive discussion and I think there's so much we could talk about and and I think the fact that there are disagreements I really like but I think we're all fundamentally in agreement that there's just this massive problem that the average scientist out there doesn't recognize how fundamental effective communication is and we've all spent our careers working on that problem and we need to keep working on it together and the fact that we can all see that this is not about finger pointing and say oh you tried that it didn't work so therefore let's not bother you know I thought Rod's point was fantastic because it's confirmation bias right if a scientist who feels threatened or uncomfortable or in any other way negative towards trying to advocate in public, watches another scientist do it and fail, that's confirmation bias. See, they couldn't do it properly, so why would I try? So our jobs all become about um, supporting people to recognise that, yes, you've got to try things and sometimes they won't work, but we've sure as hell got to keep trying. Why? Because this is the future of the planet. This stuff really matters. If we're not going to learn how to share scientific messages in ways that people find them relevant and interesting, unlike the AFL, you know, what's what's what future do we face? What what planet are my kids going to have? Hey, Rod, if it makes you feel better, mate, I'm Melbourne born and bred, but neither of my parents are, so I hate the AFL too. Does that help you? I didn't <laughs> grow up lucky. with footy. Wait, now, that's, Jade, that's... I, tell us about the Collie Wobbles. Are, are, they're not AFL, are they? I actually told an oh, inner yeah. circle, outer circle story today about the AFL and how I love the AFL and I love <laughs> Collingwood. And when I find other people, I'm like, you love it and I love it. And then everyone else leaves the room because they're so <laughs> bored. <laughs> yes, the Collie Wobbles yeah. are, are. They are AFL. AFL. And that's the aerial ping pong league. Is that the same yeah. thing? Isn't you that what it. they call it? Yeah. So, Jade, right. probably, probably like you and I can't talk. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> horrifyingly bad oh well um, so jade i'm i'm not into afl but my husband is and he's a carlton supporter so that probably means that you and i can never speak again i'm afraid we can never be friends i'm sorry jan i love it was, that it was will... last while it lasted <laughs> um all right rod, That's like a Republican American marrying a rod give us your final thoughts and then i'm going to have a last 10 seconds at the end because we're out of time Ten here seconds. so rod i bet um, you don't final thought into... no yeah, let's yeah. let's do this again no, i've only just warmed up now um yeah. Yeah, look, bottom yeah, line, okay, yeah, yeah. My, my core message is always to psych on people. Why are you doing it? What's the context? What assumptions are you making? That's that. Those are my questions all the time. Yeah. C, yeah, the C word, the A holes and the, and the G spots. <laughs> um, and my final comment is, um, why do you think I spent 10 years in your country and keep coming back? And why do you think Jade and I hit it off so well seven years ago when we started our work together? There, there's something with the whole Australian mindset. You guys have got, you've got a really healthy cynicism towards government. And most important of all, you've always got a sense of humor to all of this crap. And so much of Americana seems to lack that these days. So uh, that's why it's always great working with Australians. You guys are awesome. Um, and on that note, and Marlis. And Marlis. Oh, yes. And the Swiss. Um, <laughs> And on that note, Rod, it is time for the great unclenching. Um, I was which, about to say that. I was waiting for the. I was waiting for the unclenching tagline. Can we have that as, a, as an extra tagline now, Randy? Everywhere we go. Yeah, we're going to use it for this episode. Is that okay, Rod? If we borrow it, you borrowed it from my buddy with the New Scientist Review. Unclenching. Say, if, if you'd like to final plug, borrow it from the Wholesome Show. Excellent podcast. You should listen to it as well. Yeah, of course. It's awesome. yours, Randy. It's yours. <laughs> we shall. We and on that note, we shall now all unclench. Thank you all very, very much. We will do this again sometime soon. Have fun in Estonia, uh, Jade. Where is what? It was it two thirty in the morning or something now? Or who knows what? Yeah, two thirty. <laughs> two o'clock. Two o'clock. Time for all a right. beer. Let's go. We'll have you on next, and you'll tell us about Estonia sometime soon. So, cool. All right. Bye, thanks, everybody. everybody. See you next time. Bye, bye. Bye.